of the League of Women Voters of Volusia County. And we're thrilled to have so many folks on the line to hear this program on our public school systems and what's happening in Volusia County Schools. Who's better to talk about that than our very own superintendent, Dr. Scott Fritz, and we are so appreciative of him taking his time from his busy schedule to be with us. Thank Before you. we get to his presentation, I'd like to do a little bit of Zoom etiquette. First of all, we have a lot of people on the line and so that everybody has a good experience, we're going to ask that you do two things at this time. First, we're going to ask that you mute your mic and secondly, that you turn off your video so that we can preserve bandwidth so that everybody can see and hear Dr. Fritz. Also, for your information, we are recording this presentation tonight so that if you'd like to hear it again or if you have some folks that missed it, it will be available on our YouTube channel. So at this time, I'm going to turn over the invitation, uh, the in, the invitation to speak to Mary Ann Connors, who's going to introduce our very special guest speaker tonight. Mary Ann, thanks for your, your work in setting this up, and I'm turning it over to you. Thanks, Nikki. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Scott Fritz was named superintendent for Volusia County Schools in December 2019. Prior to his appointment to this position, Dr. Fritz served as chief of Chief of Staff for Teaching, Leading, and Learning for the School District of Osceola County, Florida. Dr. Fritz also served as Chief Academic Officer and Senior Executive Director for Orange County Public Schools. Dr. Fritz began his career in Hillsborough County as paraprofessional. This is where he discovered his why. He then became an ESE teacher and eventually became the principal of Benito Middle School. He later opened Junta, Junta. Junta. <laughs> Junta Middle School and became the principal for Wharton High School. Dr. Fritz holds a doctorate degree in educational leadership from the University of Central Florida, a master's degree in varying exceptionalities from the University of South Florida, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology from the University of South Florida. Dr. Fritz, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, thank you for having me. Every time I hear that bio, it just reminds me of what a, a wonderful journey I've had for the last 30 years in, in public education, I, I can tell you. Um, and, and so glad to um, be here in Volusia County with you good people and with our wonderful students. Um, it's been a very blessed experience. Um, I, I see I have two of my my boss is on the line. I see I, Ms. Cuthbert is there and Mr. Colon uh, are, are, is joining as well. Um, and when I say to you that this strategic plan is our plan, I mean it is all of our plans. And so I'm very excited to go through it and kind of give you a little bit of taste and then to be able to answer any questions. Uh, Ms. Cuthbert, Mr. Colon, I didn't know if you wanted to make any opening comments before I get started. None at all. I'm just here to hear the good news. Okay, Ms. Cuthbert. Well, since I just saw you a couple of nights ago, um, this is great. It's it's all yours. You don't need me tonight at all. So um, hang tight, and I'll I'll be listening. I I'm looking forward to to uh, your explanation once again. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And Dr. Fritz, I'm. This is Ann Smith talking. I'm going to share the screen to put your uh, presentation up. Would you like me to do that now? Yes, yes, ma'am. What I'll do is I'll just prompt you to move forward if you wouldn't mind when it's time. All righty. Isn't that a beautiful start to a strategic plan right there? Three, three beautiful Volusia students. I love that. Uh, we can actually go to the next page. I wanted to start off by sharing with you that our school board was very, very committed uh, when I came on board as superintendent to making sure that we had a strategic plan uh, that was relevant from the folks at the very top of the organization all the way down to those in the classroom. And so we started talking about what that would mean. And one of the things that we realized that we needed to do very quickly was to start talking to our people that are out in the field. It includes our parents, our students, 
our teachers, our principals, and, and I'll share with you, we did that. Uh, we did over 600 focus groups, and, and that's a lot of focus groups. We asked them four questions. We asked them what was, what was great about Volusia County Schools, what traditions need to stay, what things need to go. And then we said, what's your greatest concern about Volusia County Schools? And I got to tell you, we got a lot of answers. And as we were doing this process, we partnered with a company called Delivery Ed that helps school districts develop strategic plans. And so every time we would start to formulate our thoughts, they would always take us back to what our constituents told us. And that was the valued part of that, member, uh, of that partnership with them. After we started doing these focus groups, we also did an all staff survey. And so that we sent more information out to all of our employees at every group to get their information about this plan. Now we're, we're gonna go ahead to the next page. This plan has the same components that many strategic plans, whether you're in business and education have. It has your goals, your strategies, your vision, your mission, and your core beliefs, but it's got something different. And this is why we partnered with Delivery Ed because we needed to learn a process called stock take. And that's, this is what makes our plan different. You know, strategic plans in school systems, what generally happens is at the end of the year, and those of you who are educators, you know this, you pull out all your data, you analyze it, and you present how well you did or where you need to improve. That's an autopsy. The way to have a strategic plan that's really supposed to work is as you're doing the work, you're monitoring how effective you're being. And if there's opportunities to adjust that work along the way or to remove barriers, that's what you do. And that's what a stock take is. So we have, we, we can go to the next page. Whoop, there you go. The stock take allows us to truly examine our goals four times a year. And it allows people that are doing the work to say to me as the superintendent, this is the help I need to get the work done. And it allows me as the superintendent to push back on them and say, why are we not doing it better? You know, I mentioned that this, this plan is very similar to others in the sense that it has a vision and mission, but I'm gonna tell you ours is a little different. That vision statement is what we hope to accomplish when this strategic plan is done and we get ready to go to the next phase. Look at that vision saving, create lifelong learners prepared for an ever-changing global society. Have we not lived that in the last year? Our kids and our staff have learned to do more over the last year. Look, we're doing this meeting today through Zoom. I bet if we had gone back a year and a half, this meeting would have been in person. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to getting back to in person, but look how we've been able to adapt and get our work done. Look at that mission statement. It says Volusia County Schools will ignite a passion for learning and all of our students to be productive citizens. You know, as educators, we absolutely love learning, but even more than learning ourselves, what we'd love to do is ignite a passion in our students. We'd love to see that light turn on for our kids. We can go to the next slide. Now, just like a lot of strategic plans, we have five goals, but I want you to remember that process I called about stock take, where we go back and we continuously monitor where we're at. Our goals are high quality instruction. That should be number one. That's our academic success. We'll go through these in the next few slides. High quality staff, that's our HR goal. Safe and supportive learning environment. I'm gonna tell you what's so unique about this one is our board felt it was important enough to make this its own goal. A lot of times in school district, this gets lumped into academic services and it really shouldn't. It's really about the social emotional health of our students and, it, and our board felt it was important enough uh, to stand alone. And the fourth goal is resources and operations. This is our money and this is our return on investment and how, we, how are we doing with that? And every one of these strategies should be able to be measured with a dollar amount and how much we're investing and what kind of return we're getting. And that fifth goal is communication and community engagement. That, that's extremely important. I'm gonna tell you with communication, that's probably one of those never ending goals that we're never going to reach because we're always gonna find ways to communicate better. We have made tremendous progress and I think we're gonna to continue to make progress but that's something we will continually work on. And community engagement, that's you good people. We do so much more together. Our tagline is we're stronger together. We need your support. And we have some ways of putting in some systems so that we're starting to work together in our community. Next slide. 
So it, you'll notice when you look at these goals that each one has a metric of success followed by some priority strategies. And these metrics of success really are, they're not the only thing we're looking at, but those are the main things that we're gonna be looking at when we go through our strategic plan. So when you look at goal one, um, which is all about our students' academic achievement, you can see that the three metrics that we're really looking at are improving our school grade. Right now we are a B district with earning a, a percentage rating of 57%. We need to go to a 62% to become an A district. And I'm gonna tell you why that's important. It's important because perception is reality. And you know, I've been in D schools uh, where the instruction is phenomenal. Uh, just in the last week, I've been at Westside and I've been at Palm Terrace. And I can tell you that you walk into those teachers' classroom and good teaching is going on and learning is going on. And I've been at some A schools and I'm sure some of you have been educators have been there as well, where maybe kids aren't being challenged enough. So when we look at our, our goals of getting our schools to be challenging A schools in our school system and for us to be an A district, it's because that really matters. It matters to our families, it matters to our businesses. If we have more A schools, you got people wanting to move to the neighborhoods, it's a perception issue and it's an actual absolute sign of achievement in our schools. So we want that. The other thing that's really important is making sure our kids get across the stage. I'm incredibly proud of Volusia County. We have gained nine percentage points in our graduation rates in the last two years. And that's a big jump but that still means we're leaving 13% of our kids behind. And every time a student doesn't graduate across the stage, it costs our taxpayers about $100,000. Now who would go down to the ocean and throw away $100,000? Our goal needs to be to get every kid to cross the stage. And the last thing I wanna do and in our last metric is really about making sure that not only they cross the stage, but they cross the stage with something in hand besides a high school diploma, whether it's an acceleration point an industry certification um, class, an AP class, and an ACE class, which I got to brag on that a little bit. Our, you know, our five ACE programs that we have at our high schools. Cambridge has designated Volusia County Schools as the number one mid-sized school district for 2021. That means our pass rates and our participation has been higher than any other school district in the United States, which is a huge honor for us, and we'll be celebrating that. But that really, uh, that really speaks to that point of students walking across the stage with something other than just a high school diploma. Because you know, you may, you may get out with a dual enrollment course and you may decide to be a student and take, I hate this term, but they take this gap year. They may be sitting out for a year and they may get tired of watching video games, but you know, they had that one dual enrollment course from Daytona State. So maybe they've decided that it's time to go back. We want our students walking out with something. And I'm gonna tell you, I wanna highlight one of the strategies here. It says increase enrichment and acceleration opportunities for all, for all students every day. The words I wanna highlight are all students. You know, acceleration looks very differently for all students. You can have your high performing college student that is sitting in IB classes, ACE classes, AP dual enrollment classes. Acceleration for them means taking classes above their, their grade level. That's what that means. But what about the student that says college isn't for me? I want to go into AC Tech. Well, we're opening at HBAC Academy at Pine Ridge High School for those students. In fact, we have 160 students signed up for our HBC, HBAC Academy next year. And after that, we're going to be built, putting electrical into our construction programs. And after that, we're gonna be looking at doing diesel mechanics or auto mechanics, because you know what? There's a passion, go back to the mission, that passion for kids. It's not all a four year university study for kids. It's other things, but let's take it even a little bit farther. What about the kid that's an ESC student that's on access point that gets to stay in school to 22? Now this is where it gets a little personal for me as a superintendent, because while that's an important job, being a dad is even more important. And I got two great kids. I got a 22 year old son who's an industrial engineer who's earning more money than his mother did after 21 years of teaching, which is sad, but it's true. And he gets six weeks vacation off a year or four weeks vacation, but whatever it is, it's a lot of time for a 22 year old kid. Now he took a lot of acceleration courses. 
And then we've got the heart of our family, which is Natasha. She's 27 years old. She's intellectually disabled. Um, she was born with trauma from birth and she has a 55 IQ. About 16 or 17 sitting at an IEP meeting, I said to her teacher who I adored and loved, and I said, you know, stop trying to teach her multiplication tables. She's not gonna get it. What I need her to do is to learn job training. I need her to get off the family payroll someday and be able to have a job. And so she started working in the cafeteria at her school at the age of 18 in an internship program. And you know what, she did that for four years. And at the end of the fourth year, the school actually had an opening. And I, I, never, I didn't think she was gonna get it. But, this, but the, the lady that uh, ran the cafeteria went to her and said, you know what, I'd like you to work for me for 20 hours a week. She's been there for six years and she was nominated employee of the year. That's a girl with a 55 IQ that now has a purpose every single day. That's what I mean by goal or strategy E, accelerating all students. Let's go to the next slide. Goal two is about our people. It's about the recruitment, retention, and development of our folks. I gotta tell you, I, we're sitting in a pretty good spot right now. Uh, we did a lot of work in our HR department. We realized it needed a lot of work. Um, I will tell you that we are reaching out to teachers, high quality teachers all over the country to bring them to Volusia County Schools. Our vacancy rate this year right now is less. We have about 100, it changes every second, but I think we're sitting somewhere between 140 uh, and 170 vacancies. I know it's in that range somewhere, but like I said, it changes a lot. We're doing a lot of virtual fairs uh, during spring break. Our people were out and about. Uh, we just did an update for the board. Um, we, are, we are streamlining the process. We're making it easier for people to apply online. Job descriptions are available. We're really working on that recruitment piece. But we also know that it, it's, it's much more expensive to bring somebody on than it is to retain and develop the staff we have. One of the things that I said to the board when they interviewed me is probably the most important responsibility I have is recommending a person to be a principal of a school. Because those of you who are educators and those of you who went to a school at some point in your life, you know that when you have a good leader in your school that that school is rocking on all cylinders. Uh, you, you Teachers stay, kids are happy, it's a safe place. Uh, learning is occurring, there's high expectations and a good leader can do that. I'll share with you, uh, building a bench is one of my priorities. Last year, we had five people get into our principal intern program. This year, we have 53 getting into our principal intern program because we need to start building a bench and we need to make sure in two years time that every time a school opens up that I can be picky and make sure that I get the very best leaders in our schools. Can we go on to the next slide? Goal three is really about our students' heart. It's about the safe, healthy, and supportive learning environment of our kids. I'm gonna tell you this year with the pandemic has been a, um, a very emotional year. And I think my board members could, could attest to that. We have seen things on a daily basis that, were, that shock us. In 30 years in this business, you know, I, I still get shocked. I get shocked when a nine-year-old attempts suicide, a nine-year-old. And we have students that are facing some emotional challenges out there. Um, you know, they, 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 they come from rough situations at home sometimes. And one of the things that our board has said is it's important enough for we make, us to make this a, its own goal. And I will tell you, we're putting supports in our schools. Uh, we're adding extra guidance counselors in at the elementary level. We're adding 16 this next year. Uh, we may be able to add more as the future goes on, but we, we felt like it was necessary to make sure that we do that. At the middle schools, we're putting in programs like restorative practice or restorative justice. Uh, we're putting AVID back into our schools to help our students in the middle. Uh, we're meeting with our middle schools to do middle, some reformative practices so that we can have common planning amongst interdisciplinary teachers again so that they can share children and they can start protecting those kids and making sure that those kids are not just being thrown into a mini high school. There's a true gradual release between elementary and high school and that middle school is a supportive environment for them. In the high schools, you know, I, I don't know about you, the folks on the line, but sometimes those kids in the middle don't get to be seen. And I can tell you with my own son, um, he didn't get to be seen by a guidance counselor in four years of, of high school. 
that didn't mean he didn't have good counselors at his school. It meant that the counselors were too busy doing other things. And what we've got to do is get our counselors back into the business of counseling, which means we need to take some things off their plate. We put testing coordinators in all of our high schools because we realized a lot of our counselors were involved in testing. Next year going forward, there's going to be an expectation that our counselors meet twice a year with all students. And, you know, we're going to help them develop some bullet points. So like the first question will be for a student will be, how's things going at home? What's going on in your life? So that they can start to develop that rapport. We'll get to the academic advising piece so that if you're a freshman, the first question or the last question that the counselor may ask you is, what do you want from four years um, coming to mainland? What kind of things do you want to do? Let's start looking at your opportunities. And then that counselor will de develop a rapport with that child, at least meeting with them eight, year, eight times over the four years that they're there and be able to check on them and make sure that they're pushing them and developing that rapport. We think that's very smart and in the right direction. We've also looked at our student discipline and I'll share with you, we've done some things to be very proactive. I mentioned that we're putting restorative justice in our middle schools. Um, we did put in-school suspension back into our middles and high schools with a, a, a fully certified teacher as opposed to a substitute that is there every day. We've helped to find what that program looks like a little bit. The first part of the day, we actually do some uh, skill streaming. And those of you who may have an ESE background uh, know what that is. That's where we start talking with students about how they could have made better choices so they don't end up in in-school suspension. And the other thing that we, we really did is we started to make our discipline procedures a little more consistent. I do recognize that every child is different in a fingerprint. And so you can't, you can't make blanket rules for, for all kids and say that if you do this, your act is gonna have this consequence. But what we can do is start putting guidelines in so that there's equity and fairness across all of our schools. And so we're doing that and we put in some practices so that, um, for example, a principal must now sign a suspension letter. There's no way a kid can be suspended unless the principal knows because I expect if I call any of my principals and ask them how many kids were suspended that day for them to know. I don't want somebody at a lower level making that call and that being it. The other thing I want to make sure we're doing is we're not putting kids out on the street because they have a chronic problem of misbehaving without trying to correct that problem. When a student gets the nine days suspension, the principal is required to take that student file and go to their assistant superintendent and their assistant superintendent and they are to, to brainstorm on what, what uh, other options we have with this student. So we're working on that. Can we go to the next one? Goal four. Goal four is our money uh, and it's our operations and making sure we're efficient. This last year during the pandemic, we were able to go to a one-to-one -one uh, we were able to buy all of our secondary students a laptop. We were able to provide our elementary school students with technology as well. Our younger ones have iPads. We are going with grades three through five with a laptop moving forwards with next year. Our students have been really uh, receptive to this type of learning. Uh, it certainly helped out during the pandemic. Uh, it's something that we plan on continuing. But every one of these um, strategies in goal four should be able to help us analyze exactly what we're spending in our strategic plan. So even if you go back to goal one and you look at the first uh, strategy, um, that really talked about ELA. And so at the end of the year, we're going to be able to quantify how much we've spent on English language arts, how much have we spent on mathematics, how much have we spent in goal two with recruitment and retention. And so this is really making sure that we stay solvent and that we're a healthy organization. Goal five. Next slide. I mentioned to you earlier that communication is one of those things that we will continually work on to make sure that we're being, doing better. We do have a social media presence. Uh, we have really increased that. We, we have increased it on Facebook, Twitter, our, our press releases. We've been making sure that we're getting out there in the community, sharing our good word. Uh, we recognize too that that's a two-way street with communication. A lot of times the public needs to communicate with us uh, we are partnering with some uh, some software organizations like one called Let's Talk that's going to help us with our families. Um, there will be a, a dialogue box called Let's Talk on our main web page that parents can type in a question and send to a general mailbox. We'll have someone monitoring that mailbox so that the answers can get back to that parent within 24 hours. The parent will also have the option to be able to email directly. Let's say they had a, a student in special education and they had an IEP question. 
they could actually email the, the ESC department directly so that they could get an answer back quicker. It doesn't mean they can't call, but it's just another option to improve our communication. Another thing that we're doing is, is if you've had a bad experience with customer service, I tell you this up front, I apologize, but I think that's an area sometimes we take for granted and we just assume everyone knows how to do. We are investing in Ritz-Carlton customer service training for our frontline workers. Um, it's already been proven to be effective. I, I, I had a gentleman come see me yesterday and, and our folks that were trained at the front, he, I, we didn't say anything to him at all. Uh, but he made great comments about how he was greeted and it was directly from that training. So it, it was wonderful to see that. Our schools and our departments will start competing for red carpet awards as we go forward next year. Some of you may be tapped on the shoulder to be our secret shoppers to help us identify those folks that um, in those departments that need to earn that red carpet. And the other thing that we wanna do with goal five is we wanna straighten our, strengthen our community partners. Now we have lots and lots of community partners. For example, Avon Health is a community partner. They were actually just named our partner of the year. Um, and we have great relations with them and I meet with them on a regular basis. But you know, we have other community partners as well. And so one of the things that Kelly Amy is doing for us in our communications office is she's setting together a structure so that the community partners can come together and that we can start working together and seeing how that we move this organization forward with our strategic plan. There might be different community partners that are passionate about a particular area of this strategic plan. And if we can help leverage that and move this work forward, I think we'll be that much better for it. And the last slide is simply questions. So I'm all yours. I know there's at least one person on the end because they were moving the slide forward. Marianne, do I, do you want me to keep the slides up? You're on mute, by the way, Marianne. Do you want me to put the, take off the screen sharing? There we go. Um, Ian, could we go back, Dr. Dr. Fritz, what I'd like to do, can we just run through the goals again? Sure. And I could just ask you a few questions. And what I can't see though, when I have this on the screen, I can't see the chat room. So. Well, I, mean, I can't either, but I only have, there's only one comment in the chat room. Um, okay, I, I'll tell you what then. If for, for those who are listening, if you have questions, please put them in the chat room after we kind of recycle one more round through the five goals, we'll shut down the, the PowerPoint and then we can, we can see um, questions from the audience if that's okay. So in goal one, there we go. Uh, you, you mentioned something here and I'm not sure I heard it correctly, but five ACE programs, is that? We, we have five ACE programs in our schools. Uh, we absolutely do, yep. And what's that mean? What is an ACE that, program? That's an accelerated program uh, that's okay. offered. It's very similar like the IB, but it's offered by Cambridge. And our students have an opportunity to take these accelerated college bound courses. Uh, they're actually college credit courses. And then they take exams very similar to the IB program or, or an AP course. And as they go through this, they can earn a Cambridge ACE program, which is recognized by some of the finest universities around the, actually around the world, because it's an international program. And so um, it, it, it's just a very rigorous program. And it's, so it's hard, it's hard for students. Uh, it's challenging by all means. And the fact that we were selected um, of all the school districts out of 14,500 school districts around the country, uh, Volusia County was named the number one high performing school district for ACE for the 2021 school year. Okay, and is that, is that specific to high schools or is that it? It, it is high schools, yes. Okay, so that's yes. a high school program. Yep. And um, can you just touch upon, you know, for, for students at, at elementary or, or middle levels, how, how are, how is the intervention or the enrichment handled at those levels? So, you know, I'll, I'll share with you about the intervention first. Um, you know, we do have some schools that are in transformation. Um, and what I mean by that is they are monitored by the state. And I mentioned two of them earlier today when I talked about Westside and Palm Terrace. Uh, they receive additional support. 
in those schools. And what, what I mean by that too is also that my staff, the district staff is in those schools assisting. Uh, they have a little more structure to their day. It's a little more guided, uh, making sure that those standards are being taught to those students. Uh, they have a little more um, curriculum offerings to them as well. Um, and they have more support so that our, our instructional coaches at the district level visit those schools once a week and that we have an action plan for improving those schools because the idea is to get them out of that status. Now, it doesn't mean that our, all the other schools do not also receive intervention. They do. They receive that. They have those touches by district staff on a regular basis and kids have the opportunity to use the same curriculum. Teachers are, are schooled on the same curriculum, but the level of supports vary based on the need of the school. The same thing with middle school, it's, it's really run the same way. We tier our schools based on the support needed. And so we do have schools at middle school, for example, Campbell Middle School is one of our schools that we're working with pretty intensely. And so, um, you know, we, we just met uh, earlier this week to develop a uh, plan for moving forward. We have a brand new principal at that school and what additional supports we're going to be putting into that school for next year. Okay. When I look at the, the priority strategies for A, B, and C, uh, and engaging students in high levels with it's basically English, math, and science every day, what is that telling me? Is that, is that the foundation of the curriculum? That, that so our students, our, our students are being tested every year uh, with the FSA. And so what we're looking at is student growth and proficiency improvements over time. And so as you take the curriculum, as you take the professional learning of our teachers, if you take the instructional materials, the priority strategy is to make sure that we're, we're improving that and we're closing the gap. For example, the closing the gap between our black and our white students, our Hispanic students and our white students, our males and our females, that we're improving them for each one of those categories. So in the area of English language arts, we'll be looking at that for everything that I just said. And are we making improvements in that area? Are we stalled? Are we going down? And so that's what those are about. And with the priority strategies with academic success, those are the three major core content areas that are tested. While yeah. social studies social studies is a core content area, it's selectively tested. It's, select, it's tested in seventh grade for civics and it's tested in 11th grade for US history. And then in, in those accelerated options, there are also some tests, but, but it's not as required every single year like English language arts, math and sciences in grade five and eight in biology. Okay, and then the metrics up above, looking at the acceleration rate, is that, is that the number of students participate? What is the percentage? The acceleration rate is the number of students, that, the, the, it's not really a number, it's the percentage of students that participated in one of those acceleration options, whether AP, okay. dual enrollment, AP, that actually passed the test. Okay. So, so, right, so if you look at that, based on all the students that took accelerated pass rates in that 1920 school year, 49% of them that took an accelerated class actually passed it, passed the, the test. They may have passed the class, but they passed the test. So if it was a CTE course, they, they met the certification requirements that they would need. So our goal is to move that up to 60%. Okay. Do you ever get feedback from, from colleges? Do you have any way of, of getting... I meet with Daytona State quarterly, um, but I also meet with UCF on a fairly regular basis. I used to be a professor there. And so um, I, I can tell you Volusia County is, is well, well thought of. Uh, we, we have 155 students graduating this year with their AA degrees, uh, which is an increase. We've increased over the last three years. Um, and we're looking to see areas that we can increase in the future. But um, I will tell you that we are very well thought of with our acceleration components. It's just an area that we need to continually improve. And remember what I said when I said all means all, we have mm -hmm. to accelerate all of our students and what does that look like? It doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna take an acceleration course. We wanna make sure that they're challenged. Okay, uh, goal two. Okay. Um, the, uh, I understand about, about vacancies, um, and I thought your, your comments about building a bench were, were just wonderful because just development of, of your future leaders is, is always a challenge in any, any bureaucracy. Where does pay come into this? I mean, how, how 
challenged are we? We hear routinely that Volusia County is at a disadvantage in terms of the state formula. And we are. So how, we are. how do we deal with that? We go past it. You guys have been dealing with that one, the, D the DCD, uh, di differential cost, di district cost differential for the last 15 years. Um, you know, we're not getting any traction on that one. Um, I know, I know, I know a lot of people are tired of even hearing about it, but we're, we're about $180 million short shy of what we should be over the last 15 years. Um, we, we are leveraging every dollar we can. Uh, we, we are a strong school district. We are not a rich school district. Um, when, when the board comes forward and we work with trying to give our folks the, you know, the pay that they truly deserve, we all recognize that we can't give them exactly what they deserve. I told you that my, my wife, after 21 years of teaching, never made what my son started at 22. Um, it's something that we continually work for, but 90% of our income that we receive from our FT dollars that comes in, which is about $500 million, 90% of that goes into the salaries that we currently already have. That means we truly operate a school district with about 10% of the funds coming in. That means that's where we buy our textbooks, that's what we buy our toilet paper, that's what we buy our, our vehicles with, that 10%. So it's a goal of the board to certainly uh, keep up with um, surrounding counties. We're, we're starting to make some progress in that area. Um, but I, I gotta tell you, uh, this is one that we need community help with. Uh, we, need, we need more dollars. A, a case in point, you, many of you heard last year about the minimum salary range for teachers. Well, the state only gave us partial money for that, and they didn't give us any money for the veterans. And so as a school district, we had to do the, what we could with what we had, and we did the best we could. I think my, our, I, I commend the board and I commend our staff. I think we did a really good job with that. Is it right where people should be? Probably not, but it's, it's the best we could do. And that's where we need folks to help lobby for us and help us push because truly what we should have been given is we should have been given money to make sure that we could make a minimal salary of 47.5, which is what the statute required, or to do our best, which we did our best at 44.3. We should have been given those dollars to make sure that was going to happen, and we should have been given the dollars to take care of our veteran teachers, and we weren't. Okay, so that brings you to an issue of compression in terms of Absolutely. Even, even the spacing, yeah, of salaries. Yeah, and you know, by 2025, we have to have a minimum hourly wage of $15 an hour. So we're, we're waiting right now to see is there gonna be any assistance for that or is that gonna be left up to school districts? If it's left up to school districts, then our fund balance is gonna continually drop. And I know some of you have seen what's happened over in Hillsborough County um, this, this last month where the state had threatened to go in to take over their funds. You, know, you, you heard from my bio that I was in Hillsborough County for 16 years. There was a point when I was over there that their fund balance was at 20%. Now they're less than two. Wow. So is there any, is there any, um, I won't, well, it's funding and flexibility, but we, we routinely hear so much about um, people coming out of school with, with heavy loans. Is, is there any way of, of uh, supporting student loan payments, repayments for a period of time or? just to get people on board. Uh, I, I don't see that unless that's going to be something that's federally funded or a grant of some kind. We are working with, for example, like we have Stetson right now, once they are on board uh, to get our folks uh, certified in special education. Um, the Futures Foundation, for example, once they get certified is going to give them a paid stipend. Um, Stetson has agreed to offer our folks a discount on their uh, certification classes for their master's degrees. So we've got some community partners to go along to help out with some of these things to lower the cost and then give them some financial incentive. But as a district, I, I don't, don't see us being able to do that for every teacher that comes on regarding loan forgiveness, because um, that would be millions, and, and unless there's some programs out there that could help us get there. Yeah, I was thinking of it more as a sign up bonus kind of thing. We can yeah. you know, help you out for a couple of years. Um, and then hopefully somebody will have, you know, established a home here. Um, do, do our teachers qualify for the, the loan forgiveness programs? 
No, um, they don't. No. Uh, I wish they did, but no. In some places in the country, they do. If they go into um, if they go into a poverty school at at, at point mm -hmm. uh, like Washington D.C. has some specific programs, but we do not have any here. Okay. Three. Um, guidance counselors, you mentioned that, does each school have one? Are there, are there multiples? Each, each, there each school has, ratio? Each, yeah, each school has one. Uh, we, we have a ratio. Um, if you have in elementary, if you have over 600 students, you get two. That's like what I talked about that we're adding seconds. Mm -hmm. And at our secondary levels, it's about one in 400. Um, for every 400 students, there's a guidance counselor. Okay. Is, um... Is that something, um, I don't know, are there resources in the community? We have so many people who uh, are retired from their professions and um, available for, for part-time work. Is, is that if they're like certified, a resource? If, okay. if they're certified, being a guidance counselor is definitely a specialized skill. Uh, and you, you have mm -hmm. to have certification requirements and you have to have done an internship in guidance. But, you know, we'll, I won't say no to any good idea. If we have people that are retired that want to come back and help out with some guidance counseling vacancies, we'll take them. How about peer supports? Do you, you ever have um, older students working with younger ones? Well, in fact, you, you, you're hitting on an initiative that we're going to be launching in August, and it's actually a district-wide mentoring program where I'm going to challenge every employee to take one student. Um, and so the requirements, well, they don't have to do it, but if they choose to do it, that they're going to require to meet with the student once a week and, and uh, be able to spend some time with that student and mentor them. So that's one type of program we have. Our AVID programs do have peer tutoring in those, and we have those. We're going to have those in 20 elementary schools next year, and we also have them in middle schools going in next year, and we already have them in our high schools. And we're also putting in the middle schools a class called Peer uh, Mediation. It's not a tutoring mm -hmm. per se, but it's where peers can get in and they can help mediate problems between other peers. Okay. And with that, Dr. Fritz, I'm not gonna tell you how to manage your money. I think you, you probably <laughs> are, are very skilled doing that. Um, Anne, can we take down the, the PowerPoint? I'd like to open this up to the, the chat room questions at this point. Okay, um, let's see, um, first one here, what's being done to include teacher input in your various initiatives? I, I do focus groups with teachers all the time. Um, yeah, I do one, I probably do a, fo I think I'm up to one focus group at least every month um, to bring them in and I ask them about things. Like one of the things I just asked teachers about was um, summer learning. And so we kind of, we talked about that. I talked to them about um, ESC classroom supports. So I do bring teachers into the conversations and discussions. Um, whenever we do district committees, for example, when we're talking about our curriculum and rolling out plans for the summer, we bring teachers from the district, uh, I'm sorry, from the school sites onto those committees and work with us. I, I've never seen a district like Lewis County where we have teachers as involved as, as we do. Um, we try to bring them in for just about every major decision that we make. Uh, next question: You've had you've had some departures of, of important staff, uh, a COO and a CFO. Is that anything you can speak to in terms of what that means for the system? Uh, it means new opportunities for us to hire. Okay. Um, we talked about teachers' salary. Uh, students going from public education into private schools on these scholarship programs. Um, any thoughts on, on how to stem that tide in terms yeah. of both students and dollars? So. Yeah, we're expanding our VPK programs. I think if parents have good VPK experiences, then they're more inclined to give the kindergarten a shot. Uh, where we lose our students right now is actually in kindergarten, which means parents are afraid to bring them to our school to start with. Um, so we are expanding our VPK options. 
Uh, I will tell you our sign up already is increased from last year uh, in kindergarten. So I think our kindergarten roundup has been very, very successful, but it's an area that we need continually need to improve. If I had my uh, dream, I would have a VPK program at every single elementary school. And I'm going to work towards that. Uh, you know, we we're tied to some restrictions. I can't just flip a switch and get them all in there. So there's some, there's facility requirements that have to happen. Um, you got to have the little potties for the kids. You got to do some things. So there's some money that you have to dedicate to that. So that's why we're doing four next year. Um, and we'll continue to add that every single year. So do we have any COVID money coming, like one-time money that can be put towards some of these projects? Uh, we do have we do have COVID money. What, what we're trying not to do with the COVID money, it's called ESSER. What we're trying not to do is fill that with staff uh, because it will go away and then you would be stuck paying those salaries. Um, so we're trying not to do that, but we are utilizing the money. That money is pretty much specific to learning loss. Uh, that's where really what it's been. They gave a lot of money, but they put some restrictions on it. You know, there are some academic programs that we can do for our kids. That's why our summer program is so rich this summer. Uh, I can work, I can allow teachers to work extra hours if they want to work with kids. There's certain things that we can certainly purchase with that, um, but we will spend every dollar they give us. I can assure you that. Okay. What are we experiencing in terms of growth in student enrollment this year? And what do you expect in the well, fall? We, we did not experience any growth. In fact, we lost. Um, we, we lost about 2,000 students. Um, the, the only silver lining that I can tell you on that is uh, we lost less than other districts. And I know that's not really a silver lining, but my point being is parents during this pandemic made some different choices. And our, you know, I was just talking today, looking at our homeschool numbers. And while they're not extremely large, uh, and I expect to get some of those students back, we increased by over 100 students at homeschool. And I would have thought it actually would have been more. But, um, you know, I'll tell you, the projections aren't great. Um, you know, that we are predict predicting at this point of some students returning. Uh, we did have students that were on our in our online programs come back to brick and mortar after the first semester. And so we are hopeful that many of these students that have been um, gone return back to us. That presents another problem, though. It presents the learning loss that we've had. If you really think about this, our kids went out on March 13th, some of them, of 2020, and some of those kids have not been back. And so that's a definite concern, and that's really the, why that money uh, from the feds was, was designated to us, so that when those students do come back, that we can put in ways to make sure that we're, we're picking them up. Okay. Um, let's see. Vote, Florida voters approve smaller classes uh, to go into effect. Is, is that still an option, or are we... It, it absolutely is. Um, you know, we, we're also permitted to do school-wide average, and that's what we do right now. Um, but the, the school-wide averages are maintained and we're actually uh, checked on that with our FTE audits every year. Okay. Price of housing is going up um, dramatically. Certainly in this area, we're seeing a lot of housing being built, but it's not, a, it's not affordable. It's, it's not the housing you would get if, if you were relying on just a teacher's salary. Any, any partners in terms of... Uh, builders in the community who, who are interested in, in developing workforce housing? Uh, not so much to develop housing. We are working with Mrs. Sassini and ICI Homes uh, for uh, a few neighborhoods to get some of our staff uh, as we hire folks in. Um, but it's a small project right now. We're, we're talking about a hand, getting a handful of teachers. It's hope, someone that we hope we can expand. Uh, but, but, but that is a project that we definitely are, are meeting to try to make happen. But we don't have any other large uh, groups. It's not like we have any uh, meetings set up with any contractors uh, to develop that housing, but it's a very good idea. Okay. Um, the assessment of internal employee stakeholder perception be anonymous. So when you do your, your surveys and your commentaries, are they anonymous in terms of feedback? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We do quite a lot. We do what we call a strategy is a, it's called taking the pulse. And so mm -hmm. we, we do that and we, we send out surveys. Um, like for example, if we want to go into a department and see what's going on, we'll, we'll do that. We will um, let folks send an anonymous survey with their results, with questions. 
but we also let somebody be there in case sometimes folks want to give it anecdotal information. And so sometimes if that's the case, um, there'll be someone there that will take notes, but we never ask for identification on who they are. Okay. School board has committed to implement restorative practices in every classroom by the end of next school year. Is this in the strategic plan? It's in the strategic plan for middle schools right now. Um, you got to do something well. You can't, you know, you, where, where school systems fail is they throw something out with all 70 schools and expect it to be done. We're throwing it in the middle schools right now because when we look at student discipline, that's where it's at. Uh, we have some of that foolishness that shouldn't be happening. It's happening in middle schools and that's our largest number uh, right now. And so we're, we're putting it in all 14 middle schools. They'll be training for our staffs this summer. Um, and, you know, we want to get it right before we expand it. I certainly like the idea of expanding it to elementary and high, but, but that's where we're going to start. I said that like I understood what that meant. Um, I, I'm going to, is restorative practices, is that part of a, of a I guess, a dis disciplinary continuum? Is that... it, it, it really is a, a, a mentorship. Well, it's a mediation program, really, where when, when you have students that are, um, struggling or, or making bad mistakes that there's a process to go through for them to be able to correct their behavior uh, in a safe environment. And so the idea behind discipline is really to correct behavior. So that restorative practice gives them an opportunity to not only um, learn why they're they made a mistake, but also how to correct it and how to practice that so that they don't end up in that situation again. Okay. How's your response for teachers um, staffing the summer programs? Or, or, or... We're, shy, we're shy some teachers. Um, you know, we, we definitely have some vacancies. I think our people are burnt out pretty good from this pandemic this year. We are shy, uh, but what we will do is day one, two, and three of our summer programs, we will condense it. Um, is if nobody's showing up to a class, for example, we will close that class and we will move students and give them opportunities. But that's also part of the reason we offered virtual options. Mm -hmm. um, as I do my focus groups with my families, one of the last questions I asked them was how many intended to have their students uh, engaged in summer programs. Most of them said not. I think even families are stressed this year. They, you know, they, we've got to keep kids engaged but I think parents would rather open the laptop at some point and maybe do some instruction online. So um, that will be continue to be an option. There are a little less requirements as far as the number of students that can be in online tutoring and online programs. Mm -hmm. um, so as that first three days of summer programs go forward, we'll condense and that will help us with some of our shortages. But you know, if you know somebody or you're an ex teacher and you wanna work summer, let me know. We'll put you to work. Okay. Um... What's your vision for the elementary gifted program? Um, we're doing universal screenings in grade two uh, now to identify more students, particularly more brown and black students. Uh, the idea for that for us to give up kids opportunities at grade two so that we can identify some of their potentials and their talents so that we can expand that. Um, I. I don't like the magic school bus approach where you put kids on a bus and you send them somewhere. Uh, I like the gifted instruction inside their own school so they can be with their peers. Um, I think there's some advantages at some point um, to have high performing students and gifted students working together. I don't know that you always have to separate them in a self-contained environment. I've seen it be successful in both ways. Uh, but as we start to look at how we challenge that gifted instruction is really good for a lot of kids, not just the gifted kids. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's one that as we do this universal screening, we start identifying more kids. Uh, we will be expanding the gifted programs in our, our elementaries. Okay. Um, how is the diversity of staffing, especially with regard to teachers and administrators right now? Uh, I, I think we're doing better than we have in the past. Uh, I don't have numbers to quote you right now, but I know that there's been intentional efforts uh, to make sure that we have um, people in staffing positions that represent our student populations. Uh, when we look across the district, um, you know, when we first analyzed where we were at with goal two, uh, the, the numbers were absolutely on par. It doesn't mean we can't do better. Um, and we're looking at all levels, um, even including my staff. Interesting. 
We have a comment commending you for putting the restorative programs and peer programs into effect um, rather than, than the more negative actions. Okay, we are about at the time to wrap up. Uh, you have been absolutely wonderful indulging all of my questions and comments. We certainly appreciate your, your generosity of time and, and, and a lot of insightful comments about, about what's going on. So, Nikki, back thanks, to you. Thanks, thanks including me. Yes. Well, I, and, and this is Nikki Junkins, uh, Dr. Hey, Fritz, Nikki, and I'd like you? our participants to join me. And then I'm great, and it's great to have you here. Thank you. And I'd like our participants to join me in a virtual round of applause for taking the time and giving us a very informative, interesting, and important discussion of our public schools. You have many supporters here, Dr. Fritz, and, you, and I know the League has long been supporters of strong public schools. So whatever we can do to support your efforts, we're here and, and ready. So please Thank let you. us know. Thank you. Uh, I'd like back. to let you know, for those of you out there, We'd love to have you anytime. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, and we had Dr. Belgovin with us uh, earlier too. And so we, we really appreciate that you're taking time to be with us. Absolutely. As, for, as to our members that are out there, just a reminder, that on May 22nd, we have our annual meeting. It is our one business meeting of the year. We are going to be uh, nominating and voting on a slate of new officers, our budget, a few bylaws changes, asking at uh, hosting our county council chair, Jeff Brower, as our, our speaker for that meeting. So mm. we hope members that you will join us for that. Um, you should have had an email that tells you how to sign up. If not, let me know and I'll make sure you're able to, to be part of that meeting. And on June 8th, Marianne has arranged for Larry Bartner, Bartlett, our property appraiser, to be with us, who can give us a little insight as to what to expect when that tax roll is updated this fall. So we have a lot of things going on. Uh, we hope you'll continue to join us. And we thank you all for being with us. And again, Dr. Fritz, thank you so much thank for being guys. our guest speaker tonight. Totally enjoyed thank it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Bye -bye. And with that, we're going to close the meeting. Thank you, everybody. Good night now. <laughs>